Welcome, Jennifer, and thank you so much for joining us today from Northern California. Thank you, Brenda. Um, so my name is Jennifer, obviously. Uh, I'm really happy to be here to talk about this subject. Um, my talk today focuses on Sunset Magazine, and if you aren't familiar with Sunset, I'm here in Northern California. It's a regional magazine that focuses on uh, living in the West that's been around for more than a century. And I have a few images I'm gonna to share today that accompany the talk. And I wanna apologize in advance that these are not very professional. Um, I took quick scans of articles and images as I was doing my research for this as a, uh, my thesis, which is what this talk is based on. But unfortunately, I haven't been able to get back into the library due to COVID restrictions to actually take some nice photos, but I do have a few fun things to share. So before I do that, let me give you a little background on um, how this whole, my, my research in this area came about. So I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. In fact, I've lived most of my life within a 10 mile radius of what was Sunset's uh, headquarters in Menlo Park, about 30 miles south of San Francisco. And I grew up with parents who looked forward to receiving each Sunset Magazine every month and they liked gardening and they actually won uh, honorable mention in the annual Sunset Garden Awards um, one year. And my mom cooked from Sunset Magazine and from her collection of Sunset cookbooks and my dad made terrariums. They did all those 1960s and 70s stuff. So when I got my undergraduate degree at Stanford and did a lot of research, well, actually did a lot of sleeping in the library when I was supposed to be studying, I did a lot of walking around in the bowels of the library and I, I came upon this whole shelf of uh, books that had sunset on the spines. And I did, you know, started looking at them and realized that it was the, the complete uh, the complete series of Sunset Magazine all the way back to 1898. I just thought this was the greatest thing. Um, but, you know, I knew it was a treasure trove, but had no idea that I would ever come in contact with it again. Uh, so I grew up and I became a Sunset subscriber and I really liked cooking and gastronomy and ended up with a career in food, um, but wanted to study food history. And finally, like Glenda said, I got the chance to do that at University of Pacific, which started a master's program a couple of years ago. So through grad school, I got the opportunity to find a way to delve into these, this collection at Stanford. And one of my first papers was on the acceptance of Chinese food and the Chinese community in San Francisco, um, which gave me an opportunity to look at some of the turn of the century issues that are actually now in Stanford special collections, um, as well as some of the issues from the 40s all the way up to the 80s. And when it came time to pick a topic for my thesis, I decided I, I wanted to use these magazines again because I actually didn't love online research as much as I liked to be in the library and actually looking at these old magazines. So, um, you know, this I, I started looking at topics and I started thinking about cooking and gender and how unique Sunset was and that it had a cooking column called Kitchen Cabinet, which was very much a, a kind of a women's column where people would send in uh, recipes. But they also had a column called Chefs of the West, which was specifically for men. And so I thought that I would take these two columns and um, do some type of comparison of the two and look at them through a, a gender-based lens and discuss how men's, women cooking, men, men's cooking and women's cooking as presented in Sunset reflected how cooking and gender was perceived in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. But as I dug deeper into the literature, I found out that someone had already done that. And so that was a bummer. But then I asked myself another question, why were there two columns, one for women and one for men? And how did that happen? And how was men's cooking represented in Sunset before Chefs of the West? So that became my project. So my research focuses on roughly a 10 year period starting in 1928. And this is a period over which Sunset was completely overhauled from a general interest literary magazine that was read by the intellectual elite of the Bay Area uh, to a magazine that we're more familiar with today. If you've seen it, um, it's actually going through some transitions in the last few years, but it basically taught middle-class readers how to enhance their homes and their gardens, how to enjoy the outdoors and how to cook. And this was the decade that Sunset's cooking department, as it was called, rather than a cooking section, it was introduced. 
So I use the magazine's transition between this 10 year period to explore fluctuating gender roles in the kitchen at a time when middle-class domestic ideology was pervasive. And what I found was that um, tensions stemming from the convergence of middle-class values, I found that the growing acceptance of men who cooked and the role of the outdoors in creating non-conforming cooks in the West played out in the pages of Sunset's cooking department in these early days. So as I started writing my thesis, I, I have to say I was really lucky and to have some great resources at my fingertips and I had some great breaks. So I had the Sunset issues to work with but I also had, hold on, let me get this going. Um, I had this book. So this is a book that was produced by Stanford in the 100 year anniversary year, which is 1998. They actually indexed 100 years worth of Sunset articles. And lucky for me, they digitized this index and made it searchable so I could search for cooking and all these different topics. Um, it was accompanied by a series of essays on Sunset's various incarnations and how it tracked along with Western history. So these articles were written by California historian Kevin Starr. Um, Thomas Jane, who, who was a Stanford library at the, uh, librarian at the time, and the Lane brothers, who were Sunset publishers. They were also Stanford alumni, and they were the sons of Lawrence Lane, who bought Sunset in 1928 and was a key player in the magazine that we know today. Um, I was also very fortunate to have uh, been told by one of the Stanford special collections librarians in passing that Stanford had been cataloging a new acquisition from Sunset. Um, the headquarters in Menlo Park, which is right around the corner from Stanford, had clo was closing down. And the staff there wanted to save a lot of the photographs mostly and other um, items that um, they didn't know what to do with. So Stanford was working themselves, working through this collection and uh, they had found a, a group of uh, cassette recordings that was, were done in the 70s and 80s and they had interviewed some of the editors um, from, from the early days of Sunset. And that was like hitting pay dirt because these were some of the people that I was featuring in my thesis. So let me uh, just step back for a second and talk about the, this Sunset's history up to the time of um, this transition. So Sunset Magazine has gone through many eras and it continues to do so. It was originally created by the Southern Pacific Railroad in 19, I'm sorry, 1898 as a promotional magazine. Its mission was to entice Midwesterners and Easterners with disposable income to travel to what was called the Far West via the railroad. And it was named after the Sunset Line that ran from New Orleans to Monterey, California, where there were all of these lovely um, seaside resorts. And its motto was publicity for the attractions and advantages of the Western Empire. So by 1914, the population of the West had increased and the economy was strong and it became unnecessary for the Southern Pacific to fund this kind of a publication to promote a region that had, um, had grown and was popular. So it was purchased by some of the staff members, uh, one of which was the editor, Charles Field, and Field and his team decided to relaunch Sunset as a national, a national um, publication that was more of general interest, um, in part to combat the perception that Easterners had that the West was intellectually inferior and less civilized than the East. So in this phase, the magazine's content showcased Western artists and writers and highlighted the West's unique landscape. And it covered both national and international politics uh, from a Western perspective with a little bit of a progressive bent. And many of the contributors were affiliated with Stanford. Charles Field was an alumnus um, and, the, and folks from the Sierra Club and also in politics. So Herbert Hoover wrote articles um, and a lot of famous writers and artists um, contributed. So the vision of the magazine was to turn Sunset into a Western version basically of the Atlantic Monthly. But unfortunately, the magazine couldn't make it financially, and, and that was for a few reasons. But most detrimental was that its circulation was its only funding source. So by the, you know, by the time it got to the end of the 20s, you know, the magazine was really at a crossroads. Enter Lawrence Lane. 
So Lawrence Lane was an advertising executive for Meredith Publishing Company in Iowa. And he had traveled to California, his in-laws lived there, and he's traveled a lot for business and he just absolutely loved it. He was enamored with the West and everything it represented. So and again, a great example is uh, this story his son tells about uh, a business trip he took with uh, in, his, in the early 1920s with his boss, Mr. Meredith, and the president of the Southern Pacific Railroad. And uh, he took a trip across the San Joaquin Valley up into Yosemite. And as the son tells it, this is a quote from a book he wrote about um, the founding of, of, of Sunset. He says, the dramatic transition from seacoast to broad valley to high mountains and only a few hours travel made a lasting impression on dad and convinced him that travel and recreation would, in the advancing age of the automobile, play an increasingly significant role in the lives of Western families. So. Lane saw potential in this totally fledgling Sunset magazine, um, and he really saw an opportunity. At Meredith, uh, he had worked for, uh, he had basically focused on two magazines, Better Homes and Gardens and Successful Farming. So one was the, a regional magazine and the other national, but both were for both men and women. And he saw potential in ramping uh, sunset into a publication that was sort of a better homes and gardens, successful farming hybrid. And rather than wanting to show outsiders what the West was all about, like Charles Field had tried to do, Lane wanted to focus on creating this regional magazine for Westerners who wanted to make the best of living in the West. He had this vision um, for Sunset to emphasize outdoor life that was unique in the West, to elevate pride readers had in their homes by providing practical advice on how to improve their homes. You know, the idea was to teach the reader how to do something in every one of their articles. And he, they wanted to also create a rapport with its readers by incorporating their ideas into the magazine content. And, you know, key to all this was to be of interest to men and women. So in addition, he wanted to increase circulation, obviously, by providing content of interest to the middle class. And this would widen the pool of customers of interest to advertisers who sold what was needed to improve their homes and their life in the West. So this advertising income uh, really would help keep the magazine afloat. So here is the first uh, sunset cover under Lawrence Lane. So the first new sunset was this February 1990, uh, I'm sorry, 1929 issue. And it was announced the month before like this. They say in the magazine, advancing with modern trends, life in the West offers the utmost in living. Charming and comfortable homes are the rule, tastefully designed and furnished. They also abound in new convenience ideas, making housekeeping less of a job and more of a joy. Gardens are not only beautiful, but livable. Putting greens and wading pools are not uncommon, and family life here extends beyond the garden walls. The mountains, the seashore, fishing, camping, hiking are family adventures close at hand. And then the announcement goes on and on, and it finishes with, it finishes with this. The new sunset will cover the whole, a whole range of home life and family interests with timely and practical suggestions on gardening, building, home decorating and furnishing, furnishing, cooking and home management, travel, enjoying outdoor life and a host of other subjects of equal interest to men and women. So including topics of interest to both men and women wasn't new because Sunset had always been a magazine for men and women, but what differed was that the content found in the new Sunset would be gendered to match Lane's target of a conventional middle-class readership. However, you know, interjecting this rigid middle-class ideals into this less structured literary magazine readership um, that was made up of these educated elites was challenging in the early years, to say the least. And this challenge played out most overtly to the newly added cooking department as opinions about what was appropriate uh, for men and women in the context of the kitchen was very distinct. To deal with all of this, Lane brought with him from Iowa and from Meredith um, two editors. Lou Richardson was going to be the editor, and Lou was a woman, and her name was uh, Lou Vika. 
And Genevieve Callahan was going to be the co-editor. And, and because she was actually a home economist, um, she also got the job of focusing on creating this cooking and housekeeping department. Both of them had worked at Better Homes and Gardens and, and it, um, focused on also on successful farming. So together, you know, Lane, Richardson, and Callahan started by compartmentalizing Sunset into four sections, gardening, the home, cooking, and, and also travel, which resulted in a magazine that was more conventionally gendered. Consistent with the early, 19th, or early 20th century middle-class domestic ideology, the magazine's new cooking department was designed to appeal to women while other sections were designed to interest men, like home building, for example. And, and some of the sections um, was it, were attractive to both, like gardening and travel. Callahan took charge of the cooking and homemaking section and using what, had, um, what she had inside her kind of home economics toolbox to guide her. Uh, she what, she'd graduated from college and, and had become a home economist right on the heels of World War I, which was a time when Home economists were shedding that old fashioned reformist reputation and gaining legitimacy due to their involvement in food rationing and consumer education during the war. And Callahan used her home economics education to inform the design of the cooking department. Her perspective was grounded um, in the home economic tenets of efficiency and pragmatism, uniformity and predictability and home economics influ influenced and upheld these traditional middle-class gender roles and these very homeo homeogeneous genius ways of eating. So added to her toolbox was firsthand knowledge. Um, she had collected through you know, exploring the West. Um, she was interested in its cooks and the food they grew in California and, and how it was all prepared. So on the weekends, Callahan and Richardson would drive around California exploring. They called this Pacific coasting. And sometimes they would go with the Lane family. All of them would jump into the car and, and drive around California. And this helped um, the editors feel more connected to their readers and also helped them learn about the West. And Richardson describes this process and Callahan's dedication to it in a column she wrote um, that closed each issue that was called Adios. And so here is from one of the, her Adios columns. She says, in our Pacific coasting of the past five years, we have managed to get acquainted with a fairly large slice of sunset land, but we could have seen so much more of it had it not been for Genevieve Callahan's inquiring mind and her love of good food. You see, Ms. Callahan has never been able to see a man with a string of fish without finding out just where he caught them and how his wife will cook them when he gets home. She cannot pass a rancher's roadside stand without stop, stopping to chat with the rancher's wife about lye peeling of peaches and the uses of pomegranate juice. She never eats a Western specialty in a restaurant or a hotel without asking the chef for his recipe, all of which slows up our traveling appreciably. So this is how Callahan began to understand what Western cooking was all about, and, and also to learn that it was very diverse, not only in California, but the other states that they were covering, all the way up to Oregon and Washington. So Callahan anchored this new sunset cooking department with a feature that she called kitchen cabinet, which was uh, described as a recipe exchange because it was made up of readers' recipes, which um, they were actually paid to, to submit. And she based this on her experience at Better Homes and Gardens and this art, this column called the Cook's Roundtable. Um, and it, you know, kitchen cabinet fit perfectly within the, the editorial mission to teach readers how to do something and also brought into the mix that Western readers perspective. So she took recipe submissions, she tested them and she tested them at home. Um, there were no testing kitchens at that point, and Mrs. Lane also tested them at home in her home so they could kind of split up the work, um, and presented these recipes in a very practical, structured, two-page spread, and that looked like this. This is another way that I was very lucky. Um, Sunset had published a, a, a three-volume um, three volumes of cookbooks that had all of the cooking columns, all of these kitchen cabinet cooking columns at them in, um, in order, which is really nice. So adding to the how-to effect, you can see here 
they had illustrations doing, showing step-by-step -step instructions by an artist named Ruth Taylor White. And they depicted this well-coiffed woman cooking dishes to be served to their children or husbands or their bridge clubs or whoever it was in the final panel of these little cartoons. And as their recipe submissions came in, it was clear that the cooks submitting them were from very diverse backgrounds and they cooked a, a varied range of foodstuffs similar to what Callahan and Richardson had been seen, seeing during their Pacific coastings. Most of the recipes were pretty standard, but some of them were based on unique Western ingredients like the Calavo, which was a brand name the California Avocado Cooperative used at the time, or abalone, which was popular, or were reflected of the West, of the West history and residents as exemplified by salsa or real Mexican salad. So things got a bit messy for Callahan. She did her best to neaten it up. You know, she had this hodgepodge of submissions by you know, using her home economics toolkit to create editorial devices to construct boundaries around the unique range of recipes that she received. Using Laura Shapiro's image of a perfection salad, that iconic dish of chopped vegetables and case in aspic, Callahan kind of captured and confined and molded the kitchen cabinet recipe submissions into this like gelatin-like home economics editorial treatment. She standardized the recipes and began to post these type of messages at the start of each column. Like she'd say, these recipes have been tested with standard measuring cups and spoons using a range with automatic oven temperature control and all measurements are level. Or, Sunset Kitchen Cabinet recipes are twice tested, first by Sunset readers in their own home, and finally by Sunset Magazine's Director of Home Economics, which was her. In 1931, she added menus to kind of impose her ideas of how these very diverse recipes could be used in a traditional menu plan and how they could fit into that family construct informed by this middle-class rigidity. I'd like to step back a minute to you know, understand that what type of women had read Sunset before Lane bought it in 1928. Contributing to why some of the recipes Cal's hand received were more diverse than she had expected involved women in outdoor cooking. As I mentioned earlier, there had always been a Sierra Club Sunset connection. The natural wonders of the Western landscape and the outdoors had been covered in Sunset Magazine from its very inception. Many of these articles were Sunset, or I'm sorry, were Sierra Club member accounts of camping and mountaineering in the Sierras, which is an absolutely fa fascinating topic. And, um, you know, reading Sunset at the turn of the century, you can learn all of what about this whole mountaineering world that existed um, among the upper classes of San Francisco. So the Sierra, Sierra Club was formed in 1892 and it was comprised of professors from Berkeley and academics and naturalists and professionals from this up intellectual and upper class of not only San Francisco, but the whole Bay Area. And some of its charters members were both men and women um, also contributed to Sunset. And the magazine had a very similar audience. So here is um, one of these types of articles. Um, one of the women from the Sierra Club, she was a charter member named Helen Gompertz, wrote a lot of articles for Sunset. And she represented this turn of the century new woman. She was educated, she had gone to Berkeley, she was athletic, um, and she was not back, she wasn't one to hold back because she was a woman. Um, there were many extraordinary female Sierra Club members um, who were avid campers and you actually really mountaineers. Um, using a set of oral histories that I was lucky enough to re find uh, one of the Berkeley libraries, um, I learned that Gompertz had started camping with her college friends in the 1890s. And for Sunset, she wrote about Sierra Club high trips in the early 1900s. And these were organized trips that included more than 100 men and women. They had pack animals and they had cooks who set up kitchens in the wilderness. Um, to participate, you, you needed to have some time and you needed to have money because you needed to take a stagecoach to the trailhead. You had to be packed up. You had to have all kinds of equipment. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a fairly gender neutral hobby. 
And from the writings um, of contributors like Gompertz, it, it looked like traditional gender roles were really dispensed with on these trips, and especially if they had professional cooks. Um, and you can see here a picture of the cooks. There were Chinese cooks who had hauled in um, equipment and, and stoves. They, they had set up you know, complete kitchens here at these big camps. But even when a cook wasn't hired, which was the case in, um, in one of this, this next article I want to show you, um, Basically, you know, males and females were equals. And so she explains this by saying, if we have not hired a cook, a working schedule is immediately made out, giving each member of the party his tasks at some definite time and providing for a rotation of work so that everyone has his share of hard and light duties. Then there can be no discussions as to whose turn it is to work. Usually two persons work together and find plenty to do. So Gompertz is actually cr uh, credited with writing Sunset's first cookery-related article in 1901. Um, and in this article, she goes into more detail about what they actually cooked. So the new Sunset inherited women like Gompertz, who either went on these types of adventures or enjoyed reading about them. And Callahan and Richardson continued to treat the outdoors as a gender-neutral topic. Through their research in the field, they understood how important the outdoor outdoors was to Western living. And where it got tricky was decide where to put these outdoor articles um, actually physically in the magazine that touched on cooking. Contributing to this challenge was the introduction of the sectioned table of contents, in some case, cases with these gendered icons. Before the section table of contents, articles were more loosely organized. They were just simply included in a list. And increasingly, placements of articles by women that were related to both outdoors and cooking would cross over into parts of the magazine outside what the Western housekeeping section. And in many cases, the editors looked past the gender and focused on organizing by topic. There was vacations, there was hunting, there were all these different sections that kind of changed throughout the, uh, the 30s. So in, in some cases, it was hard to make a decision, and this is an awesome example. Um, you know, here's an article about venison. It's cooked by a woman, hence it's an act of domesticity. So should it go into the cooking housekeeping section, or should it go into the outdoor section because it's hunting related? And in this case, they just didn't make a decision. They just put it in two sections um, because it was, it crossed over. So these were the, the challenges Callahan, a home economics-driven editor, tackled throughout the 30s. Camping progressed from Sierra, St Sierra Club style of these big high trips to a family pastime, in part due to the increase in vacation time among middle-class workers and the growth of the automobile industry from the 20s into the 30s, as well in advanced technology in camp stoves and in trailers and other camping equipment. And Sunset was there all the way um, and following all of these changes. Um, and along with that, you know, looking at Sunset throughout the 30s, uh, we're shown the increasing domestication of camping by women. And in these cases, it was easy for Callahan to put these articles on this subject in the housekeeping section. Female off authors talked about camp orderliness and cooking gadgets that made camp cooking easier and more palatable. Um, uh, it made it more like they were cooking at home. And they mentioned the, like the newest camp refrigerators, which we know today as coolers, and vacation houses on wheels, which we know today as trailers, and metal egg containers that you could leave at a farm at the, at the beginning of your um, trail with instructions on when to send fresh eggs to your camp. So here is an example <clears throat> of a pressure cooker that you could use when camping and some tips on how to use handy clothespins to make camping more comfortable. A good example is an article by Fleeta Hoke. She was a home economist who eventually became the food editor of the LA Times. And she wrote in 1935 about the importance to her family of a comfortable bed and good food when camping. And she described a 40 pound stove that she and her husband designed that would break down into pieces. It was made of metal. And she said it was worth the cost of hiring extra pack mule to carry it. Um, and because she included in her article a grub list and um, camp recipes and sample menus, being the home economist that she was, it was perfectly appointed for 
inclusion in the Sunset Food pages. So I wanna take a quick tangent here just to say how much I love all the women I met writing this, this thesis and doing this research. I'm, I'm not the typical writer type, um, but I can see how authors can get attached to their subjects or the characters they create in case of, you know, in the case of novelists. You know, I dug, found myself, you know, getting completely off course and, and dug into the lives of Genevieve Callahan and Lou Richardson, the more I liked them, especially when I got to hear their voices on in the recorded interviews that Sunset had conducted in the 70s and 80s. And I tried to learn as much as I could about them. Um, I was prompted by a short San Francisco Weekly column by John Birdsall, um, who wrote in, in 2009 to, that declared them secret lesbian lovers. You know, I got very curious. And although I never found any other concrete evidence that they were gay, I learned a lot that they lived together from the time they lived in Iowa. They lived together throughout their California days. They bought houses together, they moved back to Iowa together, um, and their papers are housed together at the State Historical Society of Iowa. Um, also about that kitchen cabinet illustrator, Ruth Taylor White. So at the time she was illustrating for Sunset, she was a single mom living in Berkeley. She was raising two kids. She attended Stanford and Pratt, you know, she was a, an illustrator um, and she, she illustrated various books and publications written by her brother. But what she became famous for was creating these really interesting illustrated maps. Here, I've got one here that she um, started by traveling to Hawaii and created these maps for each island for the Hawaiian Tourist Board in 1930, which jump-started her success. And she's actually done, this is a, a map of the San Francisco Bay Area close to where Sunset uh, was located. Um, and she's done one of every single state. There's a, a book um, that has one for every single state. So it's really ironic uh, that these three women worked for a magazine that promoted this traditional middle-class family values while they were extremely successful independent career women, you know, living these less conventional lives. And, you know, what about Helen Gompertz and the women of the Sierra Club? Just really, really interesting women. So let's now talk a little bit about men's cooking. So in addition to this diverse set of recipes and content submitted by women, Callahan was also confronted with men's cooking related contributions. Before Lane had bought the magazine, cooking and food related articles uh, from, from men were scant and they were primar primarily focused on cooking what they caught or hunted or men wrote articles similar to Helen Gompert's about cooking in the wilderness over an open fire. And these types of articles weren't categorized. They were placed in amongst the other magazine articles and they weren't published very regularly. But in the, as the 30s progressed, middle-class men who cooked began to become, kind of come on the scene. Jessica Newhouse, who is the author of Manly Meals and Mom's Home Cooking, writes about the 30s notion that men and women in the context of food and cooking reflected in cookbooks and magazine at the time were depicted as, as different. And men particularly were depicted as they were hobbyists who cooked once in a while, like pancakes for the kids on weekends. Um, they were special occasion chefs who perfected a specific gourmet dish they liked to serve. Um, they were perceived, they, they thought themselves um, very natural and creative cooks uh, and women not to be natural or creative cooks um, and having different appetites and food preferences than women. So, you know, men thought meat was, meat was manly and salad was feminine. And as more leisurely cooks, they were, they didn't have to, you know, they thought women were fussy, uh, you know, and they didn't, you know, they saw them as those people who had to quickly put meals on the table rather than to cook leisurely. So within the pages of, you know, this Lane's new sunset, men's cooking became more prominent as the male cook um, expanded into this middle-class cooking hobbyist. So when these men contributed recipes, Callahan was challenged to figure out where to put them within this sunset structure. And if the recipe was related to outdoor recreation, it was a slam dunk and there was a male focused section for that. But what if it didn't fit that mold? Um, Callahan never suspended the middle-class rigidity of kitchen cabinet and let men participate. 
That wouldn't happen for decades. Instead, she experimented throughout the 30s, creating these various spaces for men's cooking in the form of male-oriented cooking columns and columns that focused on outdoor cooking. Various columns that skewed male appeared and transformed and disappeared throughout the 30s. So it was very obvious that she was experimenting. She vacillated between creating spaces based on the gender of the cook um, and also on the cooking genre that the men played in. And eventually she found that keeping women and men's cooking separate just didn't reflect reality. So in March, 1933, the Kitchen Rangers column was introduced and this was a male, very male um, column. It was similar to Kitchen Cabinet in that it was comprised of recipes from readers, but they were men and they were men with an attitude. This played into that gendered editorial plan. Men didn't have to compete with women. They could cross over into what was previously a woman's space with a masculine persona. So Callahan added comments um, and introductions to keep these kind of these columns that were a smattering of different recipes um, tidy and standardized. But otherwise, she kind of let the men speak for themselves. And her, her introductions reflected middle-class assumptions about men and women and how they cooked. And uh, you know, here, here I'm going to read to you an example of this, uh, where she assumes men to be occasional or outdoor cooking hobbyists. She says, for men only. You men who are always bragging about the great cooks that you are, here's your chance to prove it. This brand new department, the Sunset Kitchen's Kitchen Rangers Club, is yours exclusively. No women contributors allowed, exclamation point. Um, to this department, you are invited to send your best recipes, your rules for camp stew, your directions for making flapjacks or whatever. So round up your recipes, men, and send them, send them to the Sunset Kitchen Rangers Club. And then she gives an, ad, um, an, an address. So all of the characteristics that Jessica Newhouse addresses in Manly Mills, Meals and Mom's Home Cooking were amplified in these columns. And some of them are absolutely hysterical. So for example, in this quote, this man says, blessed if I can see what there is about a bit of cooking that men make, that, I'm sorry, that women make such a fuss about. The main secret is as much beforehand preparation as possible and leaving out the details of pickle, salad, coffee, and dessert. Its principal components are grilled steak, rolls, and boiled noodles. Simple? Surely, that's the secret to a good camp, camp meal. Simple, quick, and filling. So, you know, these men cooked for fun. They belonged to this club um, and they didn't have to jeopardize their masculinity to express their interest in cooking. Um, here's one of my favorite quotes. So this man says, some cooks may be born, but I still believe most of them are made. I belong to the latter class. It used to be considered rather effeminate for a man to be a good cook. That is, unless he was a so-called chef. Today, all this has changed. Men who can cook don't hide their particular talent under a bushel basket. They brag about it. And I am no exception. I'm no exception. I like to tell the world about the good things I can cook. And so I am begging for membership in the Kitchen Rangers Club. May I come in? So despite some enthusiastic contributors, Kitchen Rangers ran very sporadically as Callahan experimented with these men's um, art of contributions. So this column appeared throughout the 1933 and 34, then it disappeared and then it reappeared in 1938. So while Kitchen Rangers was absent, Callahan tried another strategy. This is called Come and Get It. And Come and Get It and another column called Outdoor Eating were attempts by Callahan um, to move toward the, the categorization of content by topic rather than gender. Um, through these columns, she created a space for cooking done outside the kitchen by both men and women. And these columns were a further example of how editorial experimentation was used you know, to adjust the reality of fluid gender roles in Western cooking, um, more specifically cooking outdoors. So the content that was assigned to these columns harkened back to the outdoor articles published in the pre-Lane Sunset. But rather than be dispersed throughout the magazines, you know, these columns were designed to corral Western and outdoor cooking content. And they were very eclectic 
and very short-lived. Um, they appeared sporadically in 1936 and 37. Far from the cons consistent maleness of kitchen rangers and the orderliness of kitchen cabinet, Come and Get It was really a non-standardized mess of a column that showcased very diverse Western readership and the vast variety of food being cooked in the West. So recipes ran the gamut from breaded jackrabbit to smoked fish and also profiled interesting Westerners and interesting Western food customs. So like this man who has, um, it's called, this is a salmon slidum, sl slutum, I'm not really even sure how to pronounce that, where you know the salmon is butterflied and, and, and attached to um, this, this kind of a um, wooden structure and then and leaned up against a fire and cooked over an open fire. And in one Come and Get It column, a contrib contributor tells the story of overhearing a recipe for a camp dessert on a train. I think he was going to um, Seattle. And he says, quotes, you break off a piece of chocolate the size of, uh, to cover a cracker, you toast a marshmallow, you put it on the chocolate and cover it with another cracker. Outdoor eating, on the other hand, was clearly created as a repository for outdoor cooking content, but outdoor cooking that wasn't particularly considered Western. It was even more random than come and get it, and it included information on how to choose a steak as carefully as your face cream, how to make a raspberry soda for post-badminton games, as well as, you know, hominy, con chili, and huckleberry pudding. So at this point in the late 30s, it became apparent that Callahan becomes a bit weary. And in the end, she makes comments in some of her introductions that are just both defeatist and jocular, such as uh, when she says, whether the finished products are to be eaten in camp or amid the comforts of home, the cooking of game birds in such an out is such an outdoorsy subject that it seems to belong in this particular column. The fact that these attempts at you know, gender neutral cooking columns fizzled and that the men's only kitchen rangers column actually reappeared in 1938 suggests that Sunset wasn't quite ready to loosen that middle class domestic ideology filter. Um, by shifting men's cooking from the gender neutral columns back to um, a male only column, you know, sun Sunset's kind of secure, secured itself in that middle as a middle class publication. Um, 1939, and this is actually what it turns into, this last Chefs of the West appears um, in, in, at the end of the, of, the, of the decade of the 30s. In 1938, it was also Genevieve, Call Genevieve Callahan's um, last year at Sunset. And interestingly, it was these two female editors who spent this 10 years like learning what it meant to be Western, who attempted to fold men's cooking into, you know, this conventionally gendered cooking department by creating these gender neutral spaces. And it was a male editor, he was actually from New York, um, that reverted back to introducing kitchen rangers and eventually chefs of the West. So, you know, the Callahan Richardson era at Sunset, as I said, ended in 1938. Uh, Richardson left in 1937 and Callahan stayed on into 1938 to help um, the new food editor gets started. Um, after Richardson's departure, you know, a, a man took the helm. Um, and I should mention that many of the decisions made it at, at the revamped sunset in its first decade were financial. I mean, most detrimental to the magazine's bottom line was the fact that it launched in early 1929. And months later, the stock market crashed and the depression followed. And Lou Richardson mentions in one of her interviews that you know her and Callahan's goal was just to stay with Sunset until it turned a financial corner. You know, there were, there were times when they weren't paid. Um, they, they were just very hard years. Um, the, the Sunset was beholden to the Zellerbach Paper Company within, they had gone into debt in 1934. And over that period, an investor took over majority control of the magazine. The, a New York editor, Bill Nichols was brought in, um, which really didn't work out. And then they brought in an ad man named Walter Dottie in 1939, who repositioned Sunset with advertising income in mind. And you know, under his direction, um, Chefs of the West came in um, with this symbolic male chef's hat uh, imagery and the male sunset cook 
kind of shed, shed that rugged outdoor persona and entered the 40s with this more sophisticated image that was on trend at the time. Um, as Richardson tells it, she and Callahan were not bitter about leaving Sunset. In fact, they continued to have suggest success in writing freelance. This is the last um, issue that Callahan was on the masthead. Um, and then she actually published um, other cookbooks. This is the California cookbook. Um, and they did fri freelance writing and um, did some other interesting things during the war, writing tips and tricks for um, cooking economically. Um, in my opinion, Callahan published this California cookbook, and this is 1946. It really symbolizes both of their full initiation as Westerners. You know, it encapsulates what Callahan and Richardson grew to know as this California way of life. And I'll end with a quote from this book in her introduction. Um, Callahan says, as I see it, it's a pleasant mixture of outdoor and indoor living with emphasis on the out of doors. It's a blending of comfort and style, casualness and care, functionalism and fun. That way of living explains why we Californians like to eat so many of our meals under the skies, why we are constantly figuring ways to cut down kitchen time um, indoors to give us more time outside, why we like to substitute informality for formality imagination for elaboration, flavor for fussiness. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. This has been fantastic. Um, and I think we now have time for some questions. Okay. Hi, Jennifer. Nice talk. I was curious about your uh, book of maps that had for each of the states. Who is, if I wanted to find such a book, what's the information I need? You know, if you, uh, if you Google Ruth Taylor White, is her okay. name, and maps, um, I actually just bought one at a, at a, at a company called Historic Torque. Um, and they sell her maps, uh, or, or copies, obviously, of her maps. Um, also, the, there's a map library at Stanford um, Green Library, where they actually have some of them. The first time I ever saw them actually was their collection of, of maps at the Stanford Green Library. Oh, thank you so much. They're a lot of fun. All right, it looks like next up we have Ellen. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. Um, really very impressive. And um, my question is whether as you were going through these various columns with the, uh, with the recipe, um, with the recipes, whether there were um, convenience foods integrated into them. Because one of the things that I remember when I was looking through the Sunset cookbooks, the later ones, so I was actually surprised at how many convenience foods like canned foods or kind of box. So, so I'm just curious whether you looked at that aspect and whether there's a gendered aspect to that too. You know, that was not a focus of my research. Um, you know, in the 30s, convenience foods and canned foods was starting to be introduced, especially after World War I. Um, there were some canned foods. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a mix. It was really a mix. Um, the, you know, the, the men's recipes were very classic and they would be, you know, things that they made from scratch because it was either the one thing they made or they made it camping. Um, so I didn't see a lot of convenience foods in the men's cooking in the 30s. Uh, women, once in a while, but, but, you know, in all, I would say the majority of it in the 1930s, at least was, uh, mostly from scratch cooking. Okay. Thank you. Looks like that might be all the questions we have. <laughs> But uh, you've obviously answered everything. Um, the fantastic, fantastic talk. Um, Jennifer, we really appreciate you taking the afternoon, well, for you, perhaps the early afternoon, uh, to come and talk to our group. And uh, we want to thank you again. And I see um, a little bit of applause. I, I wish we could uh, <laughs> do a better job of, of indicating our uh, um, 
our appreciation um, because I, I know it's just, you know, been extremely well received. Um, so thank you again. I want to thank our hosts at the Ann Arbor District Library uh, and to tell everyone who's watching right now that our meeting next month will take place on Sunday, April 18th at 4 p.m. Eastern again. Our speaker is going to be the James Beard award-winning author, Adrian Miller. And he will be discussing his forthcoming book, Black Smoke, African Americans and the United States of Barbecue. So that should be a very uh, uh, delicious and entertaining um, program. Uh, please check our website, culinaryhistoriansannarbor.org for details on how to attend. And thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you again, Jennifer. And let's all enjoy the rest of our weekend. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.